Uh, welcome to the first Lou Douglas lecture for uh, this school year. I'm Linda Tiener, uh, the Executive Director at UFM Community Learning Center. UFM is the sponsor of the Lou Douglas Lecture Series. UFM itself started 44 years ago uh, by a group of K-State students and faculty who wanted an opportunity to, to discuss issues, to share and learn from each other in an informal setting. We've been doing that for a long time now and continue to be successful at it. We invite the community to teach, to learn from each other, and to share ideas. We coordinate over 250 non-credit courses and over 70 credit courses uh, each semester here at K-State. We also sponsor a teen mentoring program, the Manhattan Community Garden, a state outreach program, and other projects that are of interest to the campus and community, including a demonstration facility that uses both passive and active solar energy to support the building. Last year, over 2,000, I'm sorry, let's try it again. Last year, over 20,000 people participated in UFM activities. Uh, and if you'd like to learn more about us, please visit our website at tryufm.org. Our lecture series is named for Lou Douglas, who was a distinguished professor of political science at Kansas State University from 1949 until 1977. He was widely known for his power to inspire students, faculty, and citizens to instigate change and to motivate grassroots organizations and individuals to pursue social justice in politics, economics, and foreign policy. At the end of the lecture, there will be a question and answer period. We ask you to come up to the microphones so everyone can hear. Uh, this is a unique feature of our lecture series that allows those in the audience to actually interact with the speaker uh, in a less formal setting. If you must leave before the question and answer period, please do so very quietly so it doesn't disrupt others who are interested in seeing what the speaker has to say. At the end of the lecture, there will also be book sales, and uh, Dan will take time to sign your books at the back of the auditorium. So please feel free to visit with him for a while and check out his books. So at this time, I'd like to introduce Ben Champion. He's the K-State Director of Sustainability, and he's going to actually introduce our speaker tonight. Ben? Wow, thanks everybody. Um, boy, it's a real privilege to be able to introduce Dan to you all tonight. I've been a real admirer of his work for quite a while now. Um, one of the things that I do as the Director of Sustainability is help to organize the annual uh, K-State Sustainability Conference events, and uh, Dan has always been very supportive of those events, and it's, it's really no surprise because, you know, sustainability is all about this nexus between environmental concerns, social concerns, and, uh, and the economy. And if you're going to talk about, you know, synergies between those issues, it's pretty much impossible to avoid issues of social and environmental justice. Uh, and if you're going to talk about social and environmental justice, it's pretty much impossible to talk about, uh, not to touch on the issues of, uh, of, of indigenous populations and, uh, and the way that our global economy and, uh, and many uh, aspects of Western society uh, have impacts on those indigenous cultures. And, of course, we don't have to look very far um, from our own area here to see what that uh, legacy of engagement has wrought. Uh, Dan really offers a necessary corrective to a, um, to a vision of our society that is, is, is grounded in technological progress and in a sense of, uh, uh, of kind of limitless growth and uh, unchecked by a sense of what really it means to be native to a place. Um, Dan is, a, is an accomplished scholar who writes on indigenous knowledge, technology, uh, education, and environment. Um, he's a, a Yuchi member, I believe I pronounced that right, Yuchi member of the Muscogee Nation of Oklahoma. If you're going to talk about international issues in the world today, this is also a very appropriate way to talk about that. You know, our, um, our indigenous populations are, in fact, uh, nations in and of themselves and deserve all the respect. Uh, and, and justice afforded to international relations. So uh, when you talk about the themes of the Lou Douglas lecture, lecture being social justice, 
human rights, world peace, and international development, uh, we're, we really have someone who can speak to all of those issues here. Um, in addition, so Dan has several books out there, one of which is this Red Alert, Saving the Planet with Indigenous Knowledge. Uh, I think that this gives you a sense of where he's coming from. Um, the Lou Douglas Lectures are about all of those issues, social justice, human rights, international development, and so forth. Uh, but they're also supposed to be opportunities to bring people here that will jolt conventional wisdom. And I can't think of anybody better than Dan Wildcat to do that. So why don't you give him a round of applause while he comes up here and give us a great message. Uh, good evening. Uh, my name is Dan Wildcat. Uh, I am a Zoyaha Yuchi member of the Muscogee Nation, Creek Nation of Oklahoma. And uh, it's really an honor to be invited to be a part of the Lou Douglas uh, Lecture Series uh, because uh, uh, I think um, universities and communities in general ought to be in places. Uh, ought to have places, spaces, where we can engage in, in difficult discussions and uh, be provocative, but be provocative based on principles, based on an effort to have, to come away with some sort of deeper appreciation for points of views maybe that we don't entirely share, but that help us maybe understand uh, an issue differently than we did before. And so um, when I was asked by uh, Olivia and con contacted by uh, uh, UFM to come do this uh, um, uh, lecture, I thought, well, let's, let's try to address something that is on everyone's mind, and that's climate change. And you can be a, a climate denier, you can be a, uh, climate change uh, uh, fanatic, or you could be somewhere in between. Maybe you're just kind of watching the weather and wondering, well, what's going to happen? And I think that's, there's nothing wrong with that either. But what I wanted to share with you tonight is quite simply um, a view of where we are at in particularly modern industrialized societies on the planet, and suggest to you that we have an opportunity now to learn some valuable lessons, to gain some valuable insights from peoples who are not a part of that world. Well, they are. No one can be totally disengaged. None of us live, most of us do not live on islands anymore, and with uh, certainly devices like this dominating our lives, you know, we're always told how connected we are. Um, well, I'll talk more about that in a minute, just how connected are we? Uh, how related are we? What I thought I would do is share what I think are some valuable uh, insights from indigenous worldviews, indigenous peoples. I can't claim any intellectual um, uh, right to claim these as my own. Uh, they're not. I'm reporting out. I'm reporting out on what good people like Yupi Gelder, Oscar Coagli shared with me. I'm reporting out what um, uh, the Aleutian native uh, Larry McCurlieff has shared with me, what Albert White had. Uh, from Standing Rock has shared with me, what Dr. Henrietta Mann, Cheyenne woman, has shared with me, what the legendary Billy Frank, leader of the Northwest Indian Fisheries Commission, has shared with me, what the late Bill Talbull and Te Ted Rising Sun have shared with me. I've been very fortunate to be at Haskell Indian Nations University for the last uh, 27 years, and I'm also very appreciative, and I, I'd be remiss if I didn't point this out, Haskell has had a number of very respectful, I think, and good relationships with people here at K-State. Uh, 
uh, Larry Erickson at the Hazardous Substance Research Center. Uh, got good friends in the history department, Jim and Bonnie Chereau. Uh, good friends uh, across this university who we have, uh, have joined with Haskell to do collaborative activities. So, um, but nevertheless, Has Haskell is a unique place. And so I'm going to speak from this incredible uh, experience I've had being sort of at the center of indigenous education in North America, Haskell Indian Nations University, and then all of this incredible, what I would call wisdom that's been shared with me and uh, that I try to report out about and share with you in books like Power in Place, Indian Education in America, and Red Alert. So let me very quickly, because we want to save plenty of time for lectures, talk about this title. Boy, it's a mouthful. By the way, I do give credit to the overall general level of intelligence of the K-State community. I had sent a similar title to Dartmouth, Univers Dartmouth College. They don't like to be called university. They are Dartmouth College. And they told me the title needed to be simplified. So the K-State audience is obviously is much more sharp and in tune than the Dartmouth College um, audience. Um, so uh, uh, score one for K-State. <laughs> indigenous realism. Some people might ask what that is. Well, I'll tell you what indigenous realism is. Indigenous realism, as I would define it, is the following. It's a worldview that accepts the fact that one of the miseducative dichotomies functioning in the Western tradition is the dichotomy between nature and culture. There are peoples on the planet, tribal peoples, who take their culture, their physical culture, clothing, dwellings, their behavioral culture, their hunting, fishing, gathering. Their dwellings, their customs, their habits, their ceremonies, their symbolic cultures. Yes, let's include art and culture. From a symbiotic relationship with the landscapes and seascapes the environments which over long periods of time they emerged as distinct peoples. We live in a world today where people hardly ever give a second thought to that relationship because quite frankly we don't think about culture in that way. We think about culture as tools technologies, machines, chemistry, applications of knowledge that allow us to, when we can, rearrange nature itself to suit us or to at least mitigate the unpleasant parts of nature that we don't like. It's all about us. I think there's some danger in that worldview because I think it's extremely unrealistic to think that we can live well or sustainably without taking an account, a very experiential account of that particular landscape or seascape that we call home. Now, indigenous realism, as I would formulate it, is this expression in everyday life that one's cultural identity is directly shaped by one's homeland. Now, note, this is going to pose a very real practical problem in a society where people are incredibly geographically mobile, where most college students today, according to one uh, group of social demogra 
uh, demographics compiled by the University of Michigan suggests that many of you may move five or six times in your adult working life. And so you're going to be fairly mobile. You may not live in any one place more than five, six, seven, maybe ten years. And I would argue it becomes very difficult to know a place if you're there for a short period of time. We have something to gain from people who have lived in places for thousands and hundreds of years and who have learned to face environmental climatic changes and to live resiliently because they're not looking for somewhere else to find the solution they need. They are forced by the nature of their situation to find solutions that fit that place. I would argue that one of the first steps we could do to realize what I call indigenous realism is to never have a discussion forthwith at, the, at Kansas State University, never go forward with any discussions about cultural diversity unless you are going to web that with a discussion of ecological and environmental and biological diversity on the planet. Everyone in this room, I don't care whether you're Scotch-Irish, German, Italian, from the southern Mediterranean, from northern Europe, everyone in this room, if you would reflect back historically that long gaze of your heritage, has a heritage that was tied up in tribal relationships much longer than you've been citizens of modern nation states. Think about it. Well, see, we don't think about it because we've got to disabuse ourselves to think that that might be useful to kind of re-examine that because tribal people are marked by savagery, barbarism. I mean, that's what we think. They're primitive. We've got to disabuse ourselves of that. So if I can start with this first point, that indigenous realism that I'm want to talk about tonight is basically this reestablishment of this inextricable symbiotic relationship between people and place, between culture and nature. And if you just start really thinking about that, well, that's, we'll give one point to me then. I want you to seriously think about what that would mean in terms of how you were living here and the northern edge of the Flint Hills today, how you live, what you eat, what kind of dwelling you reside in, okay? Now see, here's the counterpoint. The counterpoint to this is technological romanticism. Now here's where I've got to be careful because some people are going to think, oh, we've heard this neo-Ledditeism again. I'm not a neo-Leadite. I embrace technology. I just don't view technology of having any val value independent of culture, community, communication. It's, a, it's what mathematicians would call, it's not a functional statement, it's an operator. That the value of technology is always uh, mediated by a term, um, uh, um, the numerator would be the three C's. Community, communication, and culture. The denominator is always E, not economics, but environment. Now, the beauty of this means that tech, the expression of technology will change as the numerator and the denominator change. I would argue that what I call techni technological romanticism is what the planet can no longer afford. We can't afford people who thinking the solution to every problem humans make is another technology. At some point, we have to address our behavior. We have to address how we live, independent of a technological intervention, a technological solution, a technological fix. 
Let's problematize this. I have one of these. It's a smart phone with a dumb operator. You can ask my wife all the time. I, I'm a dumb operator. She gets those pocket calls about six times a day. And if you've got applications like that are on this phone, the weird thing about it, uh, what was it Nietzsche said one time? Uh, Nietzsche was the one I remember who said it. I think other people said it too. Uh, maybe it was Parmenides. But, you know, it thinks. You know, I'll look down sometimes and it's running applications and I'm going, I didn't turn that application on. And it's already running it. I'm going, who's in charge here? Technological romanticism might be embraced in the danger of people thinking that somehow if they're, they haven't paid their smartphone bill or their cell phone bill. By the way, there's, there's, a, there's a phenomenon we see among college students today, and it's called the IT panic attack. You know, it's called smartphone deficit disorder. And their phone's been turned off because they didn't pay their bill. And they go into absolute panic attacks. I, I got to get over to at and I got to pay my bill. Why? Well, because I'm, I'm, I'm not connected anymore. Oh, you aren't? The problem with this kind of technology is the kind of connections, the kind of relationships you have on here are relatively truncated and superficial compared to what you can do when you can sit down and talk to someone. And one of the problems we have in this is, and you guys all know this, when you really don't want to talk to someone, you don't call them. Now you just text them. Oh, we're more connected now. No, you're less connected. You're avoiding a real relationship. And a connection. Oh, and the information revolution, well, Marshall McLuhan had it right. The medium is the massage, the message, I think. And that is, and in this, I think he would even moderate his position. He was very optimistic, as many of you know, who read Marshall McLuhan's early writings, late 50s and late 60s, about how, you know, we were going to create the global village. Do we live in a global village today? Not hardly. And in fact, we'd be remiss if, if I didn't say something about the ex post facto demonstration of how unvillage like this globe is, is that we are um, having this lecture on the 11th anniversary of the most horrific terrorist attack in North America. We weren't village neighbors. In fact, my good friend, Vine Delor the late Vine Deloria Jr., used to say, if you go back and look at the fourth chapter of God is Red, he says, you know, we're not so much a glo global village as we are these heterogeneous pockets of emotional energy spread throughout the planet. And what happens when motions get carried away? Technological romanticism is the notion that somehow this, just having one of these will make us more connected. No, it's quite capable. It will, it's quite possible. It will make you less connected and less related. Oh, you'll have all kinds of information and data. But you might have less friends that you could call on if you needed some real help, like fixing a tire or something. Oh, I got my phone. Oh, don't get me wrong. You can call AAA. But they're not your friend. They're providing a service. What we really need is a fundamental climate change. And the climate change has to do with a worldview that I think is, is indicative of, of how we could address some of the most pressing problems today. And that is, first of all, If you think about the fact that just in North America alone, all seventh graders know this, 
if you do a seventh grade U.S. geography course, I think that's when Pat Ackard and I took our first geography course. And all I remember about it is we had to memorize all the counties of Kansas. What kind of person makes you do that? <laughs> a seventh grade geography, Kansas geography teacher, that's the kind of person that makes you do that. Really useful knowledge. But that's the first, the first geography class we had and um, that I recall. And I think um, here's something, though, you can tell seventh graders and they'll get. Show them the Everglades, the ancestral homelands of the Seminoles, and talk to them about their culture. Show them the Anishinaabe or the Potawatomi or the Chippewa, homelands of the Great Lakes, and ask them, well, do you think, you know, those people up there in the northern Great Lakes lived the same way the Seminoles did in Florida? And the students come, of course not. Did they dress the same way? <laughs> well, of course not. Why not? Well, look at where they lived. They took their food, they took their clothing, they took their dwellings from that place. They didn't, you know, order it online or go to the grocery store. They, they, had, plenty of, they had plenty of storage for food and plants and animals. They had it in those landscapes, those places they call home. Their cultures were extremely different because their cultures were the result of a long interaction between a people and a place. They didn't think there was anything wrong with Nishnabe being Nishnabe and Seminoles being Seminoles, and none of them wanted to be Diné or White Mountain Apache because they didn't live in the desert. So their homes, their dwellings, their food, their customs, their ceremonies, do you find it surprising, now honestly, do you find it surprising that the Lakota and Dakota, the Assiniboine Sioux, the Nakota speakers of the so-called Siouan cultural complex of the Northern Plains, do you find it surprising that they have no salmon ceremony in their traditions? See, you guy gotcha. Of course not, they don't have salmon ceremonies. Do the White Mountain Apache have a salmon ceremony? I know that. I don't think they do. There aren't a lot of salmon in east central Arizona. But if you go up to the northwest coast between the Columbia River and between Bellingham Bay and then all the way up the northwest coast, you find Indians have salmon ceremonies. You have, find the macaw have a whale ceremony. You have, find they have raven songs and prayers. And why? Because ceremonial life was a consecration of a covenant between other life that you shared your home with. And it was perfectly acceptable that the Northern Plains people had bison as a central figure in their ceremonial life. It makes perfect sense when you go across the southern United States from the southwest across Texas into the southeast that corn is the primary sacrament and symbol of who we are and our ceremonies surround corn. The Yuchi like our, our Muscogee relatives and Cherokee relatives and some of the other southeastern tribes. Our, our central ceremonial activity is something called the green corn ceremony. People in place having a very practical experiential relationship. People in place. That's what we lack today. And that's what we must restore. The climate change we need is a cultural climate change. If we address the cultural climate change, we can address the atmospheric and physical climate change. Now, don't get me wrong. I work a lot with NOAA, NASA, USGS folks, and uh, the Earth's a very complex system. And we have put 
into motion things already now that are happening, particularly in the oceans and seas of the world, that we will not see the full consequence of for three, four, five years. I mean, it's, it's already, you know, that, that train's left the station. It takes that long to work through the system. But what we need to do is to start thinking rather than in this sort of one-size-fits-all technological solution, we need to start thinking of technologies, of communities, of culture as being really the, the result of these symbiotic interactions between particular peoples and particular places. That's what tribal people offer. That is exactly what they offer us, is this insight. We don't have to be like every, those of us, Those of us that choose to live here in the northern Flint Hills shouldn't try to build homes, you know, necessarily like people in New England or the desert southwest. Now, if you talk to my Pawnee relatives, my oldest uncle, my dad's oldest brother, uh, Jimmy Wildcat married an Echo Hawk, and so we've got all these Pawnees, half Pawnees, half Uchis running around, and uh, they would tell you that the appropriate kind of dwelling is an earth lodge in Tornado Alley. They have stories of tornadoes. They have no dis stories of tornadoes destroying villages. Why? Tornado just go right over the top of an earth lodge. Just right over the top. Keep on moving. I'd call that appropriate technology if you lived in North Tornado Alley. I would call a square wood frame box a tornado magnet. <laughs> I don't think there's anything romantic about proposing that we study that very carefully and and again, now here's where I get in trouble too. People say, oh, that wild cat, he wants us to all go back and live in earth lodges and teepees and wiki ups. That's not what I'm saying. That's not what I'm saying. You want to think of history in this timeline progression notion. I'm saying, no, let's think about history in another way. Let's think about history in a spatial, in a geographic sense. And if we do that, then we can start exploring the fact that maybe there are some design features of earth lodges we should really be studying in schools of architecture today. I'd even go so far as to say if you're in materials engineering or science here at K-State, one of the projects you ought to undertake for your PhD work is study the insulating and breathing factors of Wichita grass lodges. Now, I wouldn't build a grass lodge every place in North America. But if I was sure going to live, you know, south of what today is the Kansas-Oklahoma border, southern, bo southern and northern borders, and then down through the southern plains, a grass lodge was a pretty good dwelling. A grass lodge, they highly insulated if the thatch is done properly, and they breathe, they allow an air exchange of fresh air in and out, and given the kind of winters and the kinds of summers, one could live in an earth law and a grass lodge fairly comfortably. I wouldn't live build an, an earth lodge down in Dallas, Texas, or Houston. But a grass lodge, I think we ought to do some some real serious, serious research about looking at those traditional design features and how would we apply those today. But that means we've got to disabuse ourselves. We've got to, have a, we've got to have a cultural climate change. The climate change we need, and if you'll give me five minutes, I'll wrap this up so we can have questions. The climate change we need, I'd start by invoking one of the greatest insights I ever heard summarized by Oren Lyons 
some of you know, we will recognize the name. He's been probably one of our most um, outspoken leaders in the international community for four decades. And uh, he's an Onondaga man who was adopted into the Mohawks, into their longhouses, uh, to be a faith keeper. And uh, Oren Lyons said at the 25th anniversary of Earth Day, when some of us had a convening at the urging of the U.S. Department of Agriculture on the ellipse across from the White House, where we were given permission to set up teepees and to build a fire. By the way, don't try to build a fire on the ellipse across from the White House unless you've talked to, talk to the Park Service first. They don't like that. They really don't like that, okay? But we were invited there and we convened a, a program. And so point one, Oren Lyons had this great line, and this is almost verbatim what he said. He said, we get worried when, we, when people come to talk to us about the environmental issues we face because all they want to talk about are our resources. And he says, in our language, we have no word for resources. We have no resources, but we have words for relatives. He said, the plant, the earth, the water, those animals, we acknowledge as relatives. And he says, it makes all the difference in the words you choose. Because he says, people use, rel use resources and manage resources, and you don't use or manage relatives. At least not in my family. You'll get put in your place very quickly. Think of how radically our world view would change if we started conducting our lives as if the balance of that non-human life that we, our lives depend on were acknowledged as relatives, not resources. I think we'd live differently. I think we need to live differently. Let's move from a society built around resources to a society structured about acknowledging relationships and relatives. I have nothing against inalienable rights, but what I do have a problem with is a social, governmental, political system, if you will, that thinks that all problems are solved when we recognize inalienable rights. Because we had a discussion one time at a seminar with Paula Gunn Allen and uh, a, a, a native of, uh, uh, writer. Um, and I know I'm going to mess this up. I don't want to misidentify her. She's a Pueblo woman. I can't remember whether she's Tewa Pueblo. I don't think that's right. But she's from one of the Pueblos. A great, great writer. And we had a discussion one time about this in a seminar, and she said, you know, this is the problem every time we want to talk to political scientists about our political traditions, because we very seldom talk about rights. What we talk about are inalienable responsibilities we have. I think we need to move from a worldview that is preoccupied with resources to reestablishing a very realistic view of we share the world with relatives, other than human relatives, other than human persons. I think we need to give up this fixation on inalienable responsibilities and counterbalance that also with inalienable responsibilities we have if we are going to be competent, mature human beings on the planet. If we do those two things, we can move from a preoccupation with how we're going to re reproduce the existing political and economical economic systems that we're mired in that are causing us all these frustrations and divisions and anxieties today. And let's quit fixating, fixating on how we're going to reproduce those and suggest that, no, what we need to do is if we start focusing on relationships and responsibilities, start thinking how we can create systems of resilience. Now, the cornerstone to all of this, and I'll leave you with this, and then I'd love to entertain questions, the cornerstone of indigenous realism is the following. It's not all about us. 
We live in a room full of mirrors. This is the most recent one. We look about us and everything we see is our creation and we get intoxicated by that. We get filled with the hubris that we can do more and we can do better. And what we forget is we're not in this world alone. And if we would pay attention to the life systems and the relatives that surround us, they might indeed teach us how to be better human beings and more responsible human beings. And I don't call that romanticism. I call that indigenous realism. And I'd love to hear questions or comments. Thank you very much. I think I've done my, my 30 minutes. We do want to have time for questions. Questions. If there are no questions or no comments, I've really, really failed. I mean, I have tried to, tried to get, certainly there's something I said someone will want to disagree with or ask for a clarification. Um, I've heard you use this word indigenuity before, and yeah. I was curious if you could speak to that a little bit. I will. Okay. So here's the shorthand for indigenous realism, and there's practical applications. Uh, what we need to learn is to exercise indigenous ingenuity, which my student Curtis Kikaba, in an essay he wrote for me, collapsed into indigenuity. What we need to start really these, these explorations of how we can solve problems, technological problems, practical problems, based on a deep spatial awareness and appreciation for that space where we reside. Where we learn to be attentive to things like watersheds. How many of you, there are watersheds throughout the city limits of Manhattan. How many of you know what watershed you are in inside the city limits of Manhattan? The Wildcat Creek. Wildcat Creek. Wildcat Creek. I hope it lives up to its name, Harold. <laughs> it, does it get wild occasionally? Good. It better. Indigenuity. Indigenuity is indigenous ingenuity. Indigenuity. It means that what we explore is how we can use human genius to address problems like residential flooding by simply paying attention to the fact that maybe you shouldn't live, build a track of homes, first in a floodplain, second in a watershed. Now, you don't see it's a watershed, see, because it's already been built all around. What's the classic example of modern urban insanity, it's where everyone wants to go visit in Kansas City, the plaza. And until now, we'll see if their latest technological fix solves it. You guys know what I'm going to tell you the story of since it was built in the 1930s. About every four or five years, it floods completely. Why? Well, they build in Brush Creek. Not a good place to build a major urban development. Oh, but we'll channelize that creek, you know, we'll, we'll regulate it, we'll control it. I've got news for you. Creeks and rivers have memories. They know ancient paths and where they move. Gravity does work. And um, I think that indigenuity speaks very well to this notion that, again, I'm not anti-technology. I'm saying technology needs to be situated. What did I say? The numerator, the three C's. Is it enhancing of culture, community, communication? And community now, let's be clear about this. I am including in your notion of community the ecosystem that you are a part of. I don't think you should ever construct a notion, a political or an economic definition of community that does not include the plants and animals and the environment you're a part of. That is your community. To the extent that we do that, we have again invoked this miseducative dichotomy between nature and culture.
and it causes us all kinds of problems. So yeah, let's exercise indigenuity. Carter was president and he formed the Department of Energy. Mm -hmm. There were hopes that we would yeah. a, take a, uh, a different path perhaps yeah. and invest in research and development, uh, a technological approach that would be more appropriate. Mm -hmm. And basically, you know, we spent a lot of money going to Mars that, that the similar research and development funds could have been invested in a more uh, Earth friendly. Mm -hmm. Uh, technological development process. Uh, Malcolm Wells in that era, as well as the University of Minnesota Underground Space Center, mm -hmm. were working on some of the problems you were talking about in terms of Earth lodges. Mm -hmm. What what if instead of spending money to go to Mars, mm -hmm. they would have tried to develop a uh, 300 mile per gallon uh, light vehicle or mm -hmm. fuel cell vehicle? If they would have applied that money to the the billions of people who are living on Earth rather than try to get to Mars to solve the problems that are here and now on this green Earth that we're living on, and basically, how can we have policymakers invest money in research and development in uh, culturally friendly technological solutions which are possible if the research and development money was focused in the in the right places? Well, first of all, if I could answer that question, maybe I would win a Nobel Prize because <laughs> that is a great question. And I, I, first of all, I want to tell you that. So uh, three parts. This is just, just my answer, Dan Wildcat's answer. First part is, first of all, let's be honest. The institutions that all of us are situated in the midst of, the, if you will, the belly of the beast, that we are in, whether it's a university, a research university, Wall Street, or Fortune 500 corporations, the legal system, the political systems, and the popular culture are all institutions that are based on a whole set of different principles and values than what I just articulated. So it's hard work. Don't think any of what I'm talking about is easy. I think we need to constantly be pushing in those institutions. And, and there are people here at KU, at K-State, at Kansas University, at Wichita State, at Fort Hayes, at Haskell Indian Nations University that are pushing that, that, that are pushing those, those academic silos and uh, so let me talk about where we're standing right now, okay, and, and, and where I live and where I work. So let's be honest. My favorite, here's, here's a great quote, great one-liner. Rajul Pandia, senior scientist at NOAA and one of the lead authors on IPCC, I like this. He said, you know, Daniel, the world has problems and universities have departments. <laughs> Think about that. Think about that. How artificial are these boundaries we draw between economics, anthropology, psychology, politics? I'd say they're very artificial. When I leave here tonight, I'm going to engage in all three simultaneously, all four. So I'm not going to say, what will my economic activity be now? No, I need to be saying, what's my cultural activity? No, what's my sociological activity? Oh, wait a second, I'm doing all of those at once. We, the, the challenges we have are institutional in nature and they're very tough. That's part one. Part two, very quickly. Uh, this is me. I believe change can happen in local communities where people start demonstrating they can do things well and differently. And I think people will want to be a part of that. Now, I'll give just two quick examples. Now, again, I'm, I'm not trying to say that this is anything other than just a gesture, a first step of someone recognizing something, 
There is something to be said for some of the writing now that's going on about uh, new principles of urban design and the so-called new urbanism. Okay, Even in the United States, the home of the automobile culture, people are beginning to say what they would like to have is a walkable community. They don't want to get in their car and have to drive 12 miles, 12 miles to the shopping center, five miles to the post office, two miles to the bank. Oh, and you think you're going to walk or ride your bike? I hope you've paid your life insurance. Because the way we've laid out the, the, the transportation system, you are taking your life in your own hands. That's a risky undertaking. There's one example. See, people are thinking, oh, maybe this is something good about a kind of a, a village-like re-envisioning of, of urban enclaves. Also, this notion that, you know, is we have a good example in Lawrence, Kansas, um, Google, Google Tony Kresnik, uh, a, a young man that I've just met in the last two months. He's 31 years old, and he has engineered the revitalization of a essentially abandoned warehouse railroad area of northeast Lawrence, right against the river, on the poor side of Lawrence. And he's re-envisioned it as an arts community district with housing and he redid the polar uh, warehouse this is interesting kind of an irony it was an agricultural warehouse warehouse it's about a hundred years old yeah about a hundred years old it's been vacant for 20 years at least 20 years uh, and uh, in six months time he envisioned that that could be a mixed-use, rent-subsidized uh, apartment complex that would allow 70% of the electricity to be provided by solar panels on the top, on the roof. And he opened his doors, what, three, a month ago, and he filled every apartment within 24 hours and has a waiting list of 42 families and couples and individuals who want rooms in the next building he's promised. He's going to build from scratch. People want something different. So urban infill. We're not building that anymore. Let's take care of what we've got, what we've already developed. Okay, and third point. If we start local, we don't have to ask anyone's permission, or at least the permission we have to ask is much is greatly reduced. Let's just start doing good things. Oh, that sounds terribly simplistic. No, it isn't. It's actually hard work. Because if you think you're going to garden, talk to people who garden this summer during the drought. It was hard work. But, roll up your sleeves and let's get with it. I think it will come. I think a lot of this stuff will be generated from local communities. And then people are going to start paying attention and start looking at what the possibilities are. Walkable communities, that, that makes a lot of sense to me. Uh, I'd be remiss if I didn't point out there's a young man. He's one of my heroes. His name's Nick Tilson. He came to Haskell, he didn't graduate, but, uh, and I don't know if we had anything to do with this, but Nick Tilson, Google Thunder Valley, Pine Ridge Reservation, Ogallala, Lakota. Nick Tilson's a young man who said, I want to build a modern Lakota village. No, not teepees, but he wanted to build a village. He said, what would we do if rather than this this, you know, HUD housing that's been trans, these wooden boxes that have been taken from the HUD model of what, you know, appropriate housing is and spread them randomly in the middle of, of reservations. What happens if we identified a place and we said, we're going to envision a modern Lakota village where that we have places for elders, we have places for our children, we have health care, we have 
commercial enterprise, and he's doing it. And it's called Thunder Valley. And he's working with some people that I know people here at, at K-State know, uh, Berkabile, Nelson, and Rashad and Moore, B-N-I-N. The leading, as far as I know, certainly one of the leading green architecture firms in the world. And he's doing it with their support. And they even got money from uh, the Department of Housing to do their, you know, first stage planning on this. But they're not going back to the government to ask for funding to continue it because Nick Tilson had a friend, I think it was Ernie Stevens Jr. who lives in Green Bay, and he talked to a couple of pro football players who said uh, they were real interested in what was going on in reservations, and they went out to visit Nick. And I didn't know this. Bob Berkabile was just telling me this, and apparently uh, some of the very wealthy and still living retired NFL players have created a foundation, and they were so impressed with what Nick's doing, they said, could you help us get a meeting? What we'd like to do is get a bunch of foundations together and have Nick tell them what he's doing so that we can tell them we need to be supporting this guy in the middle of Pine Ridge. Oh, by the way, he didn't ask tribal council approval. He just did it. That's how we're going to solve this problem. I'm not going to wait for the IPCC. I'm not going to wait for the Department of Energy to solve these problems. We've got to roll up our sleeves and get to work right where we live, in our own neighborhoods, in our own rural communities, and exercise indigeneity. There was a young lady that was, that was headed down this way. <laughs> okay. Okay. <laughs> All right. I was just wondering, I really liked how you said the climate change we need is a cultural climate change. Yeah. And that made me think about how the past couple of weekends we've had home football games here. And it's just amazing to me that there are tens of thousands of people who will go out and tailgate. And it's great that they're hanging out with their families and having school spirit, but there are tens of thousands of them all throwing away recyclables while we can't even get 10 people to volunteer for game day recycling. So when there are these opportunities that are local and are available, but they're just not being accepted by the community, I was wondering if you had any advice on how to get people more involved and more excited about sustainability and just realize how important it is. <coughs> Take the 10 or 12 people you can get Take the 10 or 12 people you can get and turn it into a public education project. And what I think you should do, now again, they're going to need some help. So if there's anyone in this audience who wants to help Kayla and figure out how you could do this, what I think would be interesting is to measure how much waste, paper, plastic, glass, food is discarded at the end of a K-State football game. And I think if you saw how much waste was produced, you would say, you know what? We really ought to do something about that. And we should turn that from waste into fuel, into energy. It was 13.85 tons at the last game. Now, here's where it gets, <laughs> there you go. This is what I mean, see? This is where the change is gonna happen. You know, thank goodness universities have students. Otherwise, nothing would change here, you know. I mean, that's the way it is at my institution. It's the students who are constantly saying, hey, why are we doing this? Yeah, that's really stupid. You know, we need to do something different. And so, um, uh, you know, the next stage would be to sort that out. How much of that can be recycled? You know, how much of that can be composted? you know, and start running the numbers. And then people start, for those who think in terms of econometrics, you start to be able to show plausible things that, you know, by the way, this is really not only ecological wasteful, it's kind of economically, you know, 
wasteful too because a lot of this um, there would be to recycle into an existing cash economic system. And then we can take that cash and we can do something better with it. And maybe we can sort out an on-site recycling system at KSU football games. That, that would be awesome. That would be incredible. Fantastic. Yeah, I thought uh, maybe with respect to your, your view about culture and nature, you could say something about air conditioning. Yes, absolutely. I will tell you about air conditioning. If you don't have central air, okay, um, you can live, believe it or not, even in a wood frame house, and my wife will testify to this, with a window unit when it's extremely high if you have it in a bedroom and if of course now we have a house that was built in 1892 it has high ceilings it has tall windows which you can open and now I figured out why they had high ceilings and tall windows you need to catch a breeze when you can in the summer and um, I think air conditioning is one of those things where we need to exercise it in moderation. And I think um, I've got a term, I don't know if you'll like it, but I would argue a large part of, uh, again, another little piece of, of the puzzle is that when you look at spaces like this, where we're sitting right now and where I'm talking, and if you think of where we're going to go when I'm done tonight to our respective spaces, that we have created a physical culture that insulates us into ignorance. We have very little knowledge of what's actually happening outside because we try to avoid it as much as possible. We do not have central air, and uh, at least for the last 10 days now, we've been able to sleep upstairs again in our house. And I'll tell you why I like it. And I, I told someone at dinner over this tonight. Now, I know you might say, oh, this is trivial. This sounds romantic. I don't think there's anything romantic about it. A good thing about living in an old residential area like this arboretum you have here in central you know, uh, Manhattan is that if you sleep with your windows open, you will not need an alarm clock because the birds will wake you up. And I have not, they start at five, about five, yeah, about five. Uh, the chickadees will start in. And um, I think air conditioning is something that, that it's a technology that we employ that we should use. We should use it very limitedly. We overuse it now because we build buildings where we can't open windows. I think we have insulated ourselves into ignorance in centrally aired and centrally heated buildings because we don't know what's going on. Why should you pay attention to anything if your knowledge of the weather is from your weather app on your phone? Just turn it off to what the weather's going to be today. I don't have to pay attention. All I got to do is make sure I can get from my office to my air conditioned car as quickly as possible. It does seem to be that we are addicted, though, aren't we? And if so, and of course we're using all this Wyoming coal, yeah. right? Mm -hmm. But if we are really addicted, then, then how are we ever going to get out of it? Um, Taylor's a good example. A lot of these students are a good example. I think what we do is we start reconceptualizing how we build homes radically. I would argue that even in Kansas, as hot as it gets, if we had homes that were built, uh, some sort of combination of an earth lodge wiki up that we should build, no one should have homes now that have exterior walls that aren't literally retractable. Because if you think about it, tonight when you go home, if you could pull the walls up, you could sleep quite well tonight and you could turn the air conditioner off. We need to radically redesign the spaces we live in. 
so that they don't need central air and central heating. Now, I think that would be a great project for the School of Architecture here. I think there are a lot of people who want to explore that too, a lot of young architects who are really interested in those ideas. Yes? Okay. Right, right. That's a good point. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. And that's, that's, that's the issue. I mean, there's a lot of things. You know, in some ways, even, and this is a good example, we know what we need to do, but we just don't do it. That's the cultural. That's the cultural shift we need. I mean, it's, it's really ironic, you know, that this separation between knowing and doing is so fundamental. Well, no, I think I, but I see, I, I don't think this is a notion. Change your, change your notion of history. Quit thinking along this temporal timeline of this is forward, this is backward. And I think where we are today is, is again, think about the applications of technology. Do it differently. You can insulate your homes. You can still turn on the air conditioner 10 times in the summer as opposed to having it running continuously and heating the whole house, although you're not living in the whole house. Okay, and and I think this is exactly, you know, the message that I'll leave you with, and then we can, you know, some of you, you know, if I've really got you disgusted with what I said today, I think what you should do is still buy a book, <laughs> and then and then what you want to do is you want to find some you someone you really dislike and give it to them <laughs> for a present. You know, so that's my advice, you know, even if you go, like, God, that guy's a nut, you know. Well, just buy the book and give it to someone you really dislike, you know. That'd be a good present. Um, let, that point's such a great one, and so I want to leave you with, with this thought. Um, there's a quote that, that's uh, attributed to... I've heard it to Mark Twain. I was introduced to it through Satchel Page, and uh, it was attributed to Satchel Page. And so I'll give you the Satchel Page version, and then we can have some of you know the more literati correct me on what the proper attribution should be. Sounds like something either one of them could say. But in the version that was given to me by a Potawatomi elder, he said, uh, "You know what Satchel Page told the young player when he was asked for what the best advice." he could get was, and I said, no, what was it? He said, this young player went up to Satchel Page and said, so tell me, Satchel, you know, what's the best thing I can do to be, a, a, you know, the best ball player I can be? And he said, 
Well, just remember, young man, it's not what you don't know that gets you in trouble. It's what you know that just ain't so that causes all the problems. I find that instructive because it makes us all accept some humility in terms of, of what we're doing. There's not anyone who's holier than thou in here. I mean, uh, well, occasionally I do run into in environmentalists who are holier than thou. And quite frankly, I'd never invite them to any, a group of Indians because the, the Indians would all go like, my God, where did these people come from? You know, no, we live in the real world. We're, we, we, we work with compromise. We work with conflict. And so, but the fact that you're a conscious, that you're thinking about this, you're, you're on the right path. You're doing something good, you know. And so just... Just stay humble. We don't have to have all the answers. None of us do. And that's why having discussions are important. That's why coming together is important. So I want to thank uh, everyone uh, with UFM and, and particularly to Olivia and uh, Linda for helping get this thing all put together and uh, Ben for a marvelous uh, introduction and... Um, Thank you all for, for coming out tonight.